Okay, good day everyone and uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction and for uh, inviting me to uh, give this presentation. Um, so I'm talking about cybersecurity and uh, AI risk management challenges for the next generation of public safety systems. Um, you know, in that uh, in the uh, introductory speech, we talked about you know, healthcare being a massive uh, target. What was touched on there that we'll expand on a little bit in this talk is that the folks who are keeping us safe are themselves very poorly resourced on cyber, but they're also being inundated with more and more people selling them things, selling them AI, selling them all these, that and the other. And there is a massive, massive asymmetry in the amount of understanding between public safety folks who are keeping us safe and these people who are trying to push whatever they're trying to push, just in terms of information generally, not even in terms of risk management. How do we help with this? So that's kind of going to be what I'm going to talk about uh, for the next half hour or so. Um, the usual uh, disclaimer that we all have, okay, um, these are my views. They're not uh, representative of the views of NIST, Johns Hopkins, any organization that I am or have been affiliated with, and certain commercial products may be identified, therefore fostering understanding. Um, they don't imply recommendation or endorsement by myself or anyone else. So, uh, by the way, I, everyone can hear me when I'm doing this right? Yeah, yeah. all good? Perfect. Okay, so a uh, very quick uh, introduction, who am I? Um, so um, I, um, I am a doctor, not the healthcare kind of doctor. I do surgery on robots, um, not surgery with robots. Um, but uh, my uh, PhD is in uh, AI, uh, robot behaviors. In that wonderful, wonderful period between the end of the last AI winter and the influx of deep learning when mathematical rigor kind of mattered. I might be bitter. Um, I got one chuckle from someone. Okay, I, I, I might actually have a chance with this audience. By the way, um, first time at B-Sides, so um, thank you. <laughs> so apologies, apologies if this talk is completely off from, uh, from what you're used to at B-Sides because I've got no idea what you're used to here at B-Sides. Um, but uh, I had a, a long-term interest in uh, cybersecurity just from a fun perspective. Um, who here remembers the first edition of Hacking Exposed? The book, okay, yeah, so that was kind of my entry into, into this, um, you know, back in the, back in the days of, uh, of uh, you, know, you know, doing, messing with Windows NT and, and all, that, all that fun stuff. Um, and, you know, I, apart from playing with robots, I, I did things like, uh, you know, teaching cybercrime and secure programming and industrial automation robotics and things like that. Um, Relative to this discussion we're having here, though, and things moving slowly. So, um, so actually, last year was my first DEF CON. Uh, prior to that, I had actually a bit of a gap. And my previous cybersecurity conference was SANS 2013. And it was interesting seeing all the things that in 2013 they said these will be solved in 10 years and came to DEF CON and they're not. Um, how do we, you know, but we need to adjust, we need to deal with this because 2027 is not that far away. And where this is particularly problematic is with these things, right? These things. You know, you we're having a hard enough time dealing with them from a network's perspective, from a computer's perspective, from a cell phone's perspective. What do you deal with when it's a medical device or when it's a robot? And as was mentioned, you cycle these things out in 15 years, right? What do you deal with it when it's a car? This wasn't the point of this car, but anyway. So, you know, anyway, so my background is in very much on the measurement science requirements side of the house. That's why we have a car full of QR codes. Um, testing the ability of robots to actually see, is this the car I'm looking for, right? Is this the lost hiker? Is this the person who actually needs our attention? When a robot goes in, you know, when they're doing triage, who is actually, you know, who, who is, who is uh, uh, you know, injured and so on? You know, how do we measure the vision? That's kind of where that's going from. Anyway, teaching, all that stuff. Anyway, um, moving on. Why am I doing this? I'm doing this because I see the big issue here is people are shouting into the ether and the ether isn't listening, right? I really, really loved the way it was put earlier that we need to speak to these people in their love language, right? And I hope to be able to talk to you a little bit about how to speak 
the love language of public safety because these people are crying out for our expertise, right? They're crying out for something that's going to help them deal with this information asymmetry where they're being sold all this stuff and you know, they're being pressed on saying, hey, this will help you with your outcomes or as some of them get told, if you don't adopt this, people are gonna die and they don't know what the alternative is or what the downside is, okay? Um, anyway, so, um, as may have been alluded to, again, I'm representing myself, but I did do a lot of work with NIST. Um, I like definitions. This is the first pain point that you will find when you're talking to public safety, or in fact, to, and you pro actually, this is probably not, not to, uh, you know, unfamiliar to most of you anyway, is that there are lots and lots of people who mess up with the de mess with the definitions to try and get people to buy their thing, right? And the problem with the public safety run up against is they're used to having very good definitions for things. They're not used to people playing silly buggers with the definitions like this. So I'm going to I'm going to propose uh, a few a few things here for this discussion. Cybersecurity. We all know what cybersecurity is, right? We're at a cybersecurity event. Um, if you've gone and had a look at all of the various um, cybersecurity framework or guideline things, and you compare all the definitions and see what is and isn't part of it, okay? Now, you know, I, t I like NIST um, SB 853, Prevention of Damage to Protection of and Restoration of Computers, blah, 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 you, all that. Um, make sure that the people you're talking to know what, you're what is even within scope of what you're talking about. That one's easy. This is the one that I love. What's artificial intelligence? I, as, a, as a devout Australian, um, I have a, a nice saying for this one. The definition for artificial intelligence is like the definition for football. We are not going to agree, right? Um, I, I used to get very, very upset with people when they use the wrong definition of AI. Right now, right now, AI, everyone thinks AI is like generative stuff or deep neural networks or something. Um, you know, I remember a time when everyone was getting upset that AI, everyone thought AI was machine learning. This is actually the first one that, um, that public safety people and actually people who have this asymmetry get really, really wrong. And that is that AI is many, many things. Where this is important is that there are many ways of getting the result. There are many ways of doing license plate recognition. There are many ways of doing routing of your, your ambulance. There are many ways of figuring out where to put your next fire station to get the best response, right? It's not just deep learning. Um, helping to educate these people saying, there are alternatives that are not just throw deep learning at the problem or the latest you know, deep learning startup and so on. On the flip side of this on the AI side is that there are many dangers that are posed by AI that these people don't know about, right? And that we as practitioners of the computer sciences need to educate them about. For example, um, one discussion that I had in this, and we'll talk about this later for Next Generation 911. Yes, we're gonna talk about that in a sec. Um, who here knows about swatting? Who in here knows about next generation 911? Okay, so for the, 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 the sort of really quick version, it's 911, but it lets you also submit imagery and video because it helps, it's, it's rather than, you know, having some panicked caller calling 911 and they can't talk coherently because they're in a panic and the best of us get there, I've been there, yeah, and I thought I was pretty level-headed. Right? You can just send a picture and they can know exactly what's going on. How much easier is it to swat someone when you have generative AI? Now, that's bad, but at least the 911 folks kind of know about this. They know enough about it to say, yes, this is a problem. They know little enough about this to say, but we'll just train another AI to detect it. <laughs> okay? 
Um, there is a lot of education that we need to do out there just on these basic concepts around AI. Public safety. This is a scope question, okay? Public safety is not just your, you know, ambulance, fire, police, whoever, right? This country loves its privatization. Public safety also includes all of the companies that are providing contract services who are not necess who now ha are kind of can be in the, the worst of both worlds, right? Insofar as they have to be commercially competitive, they have to sell their service, so they have to be buzzword compliant. And they may not be fully regulated the same way. And they may not have the resources or the impetus. And yet these people are also part of public safety. Insofar as, you know, as was mentioned before, talking about healthcare, your hospital can do everything right, but if the insurance processor gets popped, you're still screwed. Um, let's see. Um, contract supplies, okay. Um, risk management. Um, you know, we're talking about identifying and controlling risks, and a big chunk of risk management here that we all, I think, need to, if we're talking with these folks, need to be very cognizant about with a few things. The first one is risk management is not risk minimization. It is not risk elimination. It is not risk avoidance. What do I mean by this? These are people who are authorized to drive 20 ton vehicles the wrong way down Main Street through red lights. That is not risk elimination or risk minimization from a driving perspective. But it is a risk minimization from a society perspective relative to the probability of something going really bad if they don't get to the burning building in time. Right? But society participates in that risk management. When we hear the sirens and we see the lights, we know that we need to do our part and get out of the way or be more attentive or at least be aware that something strange is about to happen and be more attentive in our risk management. Okay? Very simple example of how this, how, and this is, so this is, you know, we're talking, I think it was mentioned earlier, these people don't have the resources to just apply a particular risk management thing to what they do. It's worse than that. Their use case may not even allow it. For example, you have a large fire. You have multiple fire departments responding. They all have their devices, right? Someone's going in. They see, you know, for whatever reason, their, their communication device is broken offline. They come across someone from another squad that's down. Their device is working. They need to be able to pick it up and use it. They don't know what the password is. They're not even necessarily on the same authentication system. Their federated you know, access control, it may not even be compatible. Right? They have to get to yes on using that device. What happens if you just slap a corporate device management policy on it? Not going to work, yeah? Okay. Risk management is a really tricky sticking point for a lot of these organizations. Where and how to adapt these things that we all know from corporate and normal risk management. How do we make it work for public safety, but also for water, for you know, food supply, for all of this? There are nuances that organizations don't even have the resources to be aware of. We need to be aware of them, at least when we're writing things, to at least make these call-outs, right? 
I'm sure a lot of people here write policy and things. You know, be mindful of, hey, there may be call-outs that at least flag, hey, this is a thing. And next generation systems. What is a next generation system? In this context, we're focusing on things that are moving fast enough that the risks are not obvious given what has come before. That's a kind of a weird definition. When we're talking about managing risk, especially for these organizations where the personnel, they're, they're, be, they're, they're employed because they're great firefighters, right? Where they're employed because they will run into a burning building. Good heavens, I'm not gonna run into a burning building, right? These people are good at that. They're not employed because they're good at technology. That's not their job, yeah? We need to help them get ahead of this and part of that starts with being mindful of, of their pain points and challenges. Um, by the way, this is, I'm going to sort of blast through the, some of the rest of this just because I want to have lots and lots of discussion uh, at the end. So, but anyway, some examples of public safety systems. We talked about next generation 911. Um, robots and drones, yeah? Um, you know, who here is, does sort of you know, OT type or IOT type stuff? Okay, um, now imagine that your thing is now flying in the sky over there somewhere and you've got no idea if you're going to get it back. Um, you know, you have all kinds of sort of fun there um, with your robots and your drones. Um, and that's ignoring even all of the, uh, the, the um, uh, uh, sort of geo geopolitical overlay and the, uh, and the sec security overlay that's, that's happening right now. Um, you have increasingly connected systems. Um, and this is... You know, your, you know, your, your dispatch system um, that tells, you know, where to, you know, which ambulance to send where is connected to your 911 system. Your 911 system is connected to your, 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 your drone system. Your drone system is connected to your geographical information system. And anyone can get in anywhere, right? Um, who here is familiar with what happened to Baltimore a few years ago? Baltimore 911. Okay, a few of you. Uh, for those of you who aren't, um, you know, have a look. It's actually it's public knowledge now. Where there's been case studies and all that. Nine, um, Baltimore's 911 system got ransomware. It took down all of the computer systems that they use to filter and screen to to actually go through all of their the 911 calls and send them out to dispatch. They kept going because all of the management, all the people who would normally be in management, were running pieces of paper from room to room. Guess what saved them and, call, and helped them get back? I'm oh, sorry, by the way, guess what caused them to happen in the first place? Contractor dropped the firewall to make something work. Um, guess what got them back up? A fire department happened to have a backup server. That's the really, really short version. There's way more nuance to it than that. I'm oversimplifying, right? But these, these increasingly connected systems are running far, far ahead of their ability to deal with this. Um, increasingly smart vehicles and routing, okay? People don't generally think very much about the AI that's in their, you know, Google or Waze or whatever your routing system is, right? That can kind of be life or death if you're trying to route an ambulance. How is their data getting cleaned? How is, what are their risks involved when they switch from one system to another? So, what is some low-hanging fruit? How do we figure out low-hanging fruit for what do we, for what, what, what do we think about? Because one of, what we don't want to do is go into the local fire department and go, hey, you need to adopt, I don't know, pick your favorite framework, all right? At best, they're going to tell you to go away. At worst, they're actually going to try and do it. <laughs> I didn't get that backwards. Got to think about it. Okay. A few things to think about. Overall technical impact, okay? Is this actually going to make a difference? Um, and actually, a lot of things when you think about it, is this actually going to make a difference? Actually, you've got to think about it. You know, how bad can it get? This seems to get the most attention. But that's also not the most important thing, right? What is the likelihood of negative impact, right?
This is one that people generally really don't think about. What is the likelihood of acceptance and understanding? A fire department or a you know ambulance or whatever is way more like you're way, you know, likely to get way more compliance if there's acceptance and understanding. If it's something they already know they need to be dealing with, and where the solution is of the type that they can actually incorporate into their operations. If you go to them and say, here is something that has great technical impact, is really likely, and they go, huh? You've got an uphill battle. I'm not saying those things aren't important. But, doing, but being very aware of the likelihood of acceptance and understanding is, is, is critical. And let's see, actionability, likelihood of real world reduction in risk. And actually, I skimmed over my background. So where this has come from in my previous life, so I was developing performance measurements for robots for the robots that go into the building that even the firefighters won't go into and figure out if there's anyone there or figure out if the structure is safe enough for them to go into or that you know fly over the next ridge after a you know after there's been a bit an earthquake or whatever and see what's going on over there and things like that and a lot of the last two bullets are things that vendors don't seem to speak to when they're talking with these people. Is this actually going to make my life better? Is this actually going to increase the outcomes? Or improve the outcomes? Okay. So, we really need to talk to these people. How do we talk to them? Again, if we just show up to the local firehouse, unless we already know them, they're probably going to go, who are you? <laughs> right? What's our way in? Right? We're the cavalry. <laughs> how, do we, how do we tell? How, how do we do it such that they know that, 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 that we are the cavalry? Okay. So, these people love their guidance and regulations. Okay? They're, you know, they have procedures, they have standards for everything, right? I mean, some of the earlier standards came out from issues where a whole bunch of Fire departments showed up to the same disaster and they couldn't connect their fire hoses together because none of the fire hoses would link up. Right? These people like their standards. There are many things out there that these people look at and listen to, right? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with NIST cybersecurity framework and the AI risk management framework. I mean, who here is in, you know, knows about either of those two documents, okay? These documents are put together with public comment. We need people to write into these when they submit their R when they put out RFIs, when they put out their drafts, and say, hey, sounds great. Maybe we, there needs to be a call out for the folks who have slightly different use cases. And I'm not just, by the way, everything I've talked about, I've talked about in the context of public safety, it's not just public safety. It's anyone who has a weird use case and a weird risk management profile, right? They need call outs for this, right? Um, you know, how, how many people have seen a framework or a top 10 or a something used for something that's completely inappropriate, right? We need to write commentary. We need to, you know, talk about how these things are, you know, applied inappropriately. We need to be, you know, who, 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 by the way, who here is actually involved in writing policy? Okay. So... When you write policy, you also have guidance documents around them, right? Acknowledging the exceptions is a big chunk of this. So that that way, because the problem is the person who is helping public safety do, do this guidance and regulation stuff, they're not necessarily familiar with this either. They need that prompt to tell them, hey, for my application, I need to think about this. Social media and podcasts, you know, the whole, the, 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 the joke, um, how, do you, how, do you, uh, how do you get a message out? And this is old, but... Telephone, telefax, telefirefighter. Okay, it's all the, the people who laugh laugh quietly because they're showing they're, they're little, been, been here for it too long. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> so you know these people talk to each other. There are plenty of social media podcasts and things that these people listen to. They really want people like us to talk to them. They don't know who to reach out to. Right. We need to be talking to these people. We like, I mean, a lot of us like to talk, or at least pretend to like to talk, okay? 
we need to reach out to these communities through these avenues. Because here's the thing. Here's who's also reaching out through these avenues. The vendors who are telling them half the truth. Um, events. So similarly, you know, trade shows, conferences, conventions, again, they're always looking for people who not just, who don't just understand the cybersecurity side of the house, but understand what I was talking about before about their nuance. They don't just want someone to stand up and say, rotate your passwords, patch everything, yeah, put a firewall up, use a VPN. You know, they want someone who can actually translate that into what is actually technically actionable in their application and it's actually gonna be usable for them. And they need people to talk to them about these things. Because again, guess who's at these trade shows? And the thing is, by the way, I'm not sort of casting shade on the vendors, right? The, their, their job is there to do a thing. But there is that information asymmetry that we need to help them with. Um, you know, those of you who are sales representatives, okay? Now I'm talking to the other side of that, okay? Again, you have a job to do. The thing I often argue, the, f the thing I often point out though, and actually I did this a lot back when I was doing robot testing. The worst, and you know, I'll talk about robots for this. The worst robot in the world is indistinguishable from the best robot in the world used for the wrong purpose. If I'm a robot vendor, I do not want to sell my robot to someone who is going to use it for the wrong purpose and get a bad result. Because remember what I said, telephone, telefax, telefirefighter, right? Everyone is gonna know, everyone is gonna be told that my product is terrible. With, when it's not terrible, it's just that it was sold for the wrong purpose, right? Um, we're actually, we've, we've, we have made inroads on that side of the house for folks who are actually using, for sales folks who are using these standards to tell people my, ro my product is not good for this. Do not use it for this. I would rather you buy someone else's product. Um, I'm a little bit out from how that works on the, on the cybersecurity side of the house. Um, I don't know how much of that is happening um, from this side, from the other side. I know they're getting horribly confused. <laughs> um, but that I think should be something that people think about and they point and point out, you know, hey, I've just realized you've got, you got this thing, you need to think about this risk when you're talking about my product. And of course, trainers, uh, industry organizations. Um, you know, the, again, the industry organizations for public safety are crying out for the kind of expertise that again is gonna sit down with them and go, and not, and not to push a product, not to just parrot, have strong passwords, you know, use a VPN, no who actually can do a put, and it, I mean, from, from our perspective as practitioners, it, it's not actually that much additional thought, but it's thought that, that they need, that they don't understand. Okay, so that's kind of, you know, I guess that's not even really their love language as much as it is figuring out how to even get to the point where we're talking about their love language, okay? I guess we talked a little bit about love language earlier on. But anyway, um, I have a, a 10, minute, uh, 10 minute call, which is perfect. So, let's have a little bit of discussion. How do we help those who keep us safe? So I guess the first question is, who here has, um, I guess we have a microphone run around, or do we want to, maybe do I, do we have a, how do we want to do this? Or, so, I keep it, okay. Okay, so, um, actually just a bit of show of hands by the way, who here has actually interacted with public safety the way I've defined it? Perfect, okay, so. I've come at this from a particular angle. Is there anything critical here that any of you folks who have dealt with public safety think that I've missed? Please. Because, of course, I'm an academic, right? I spent 20 years in academia and government research, so. I've been barely containing myself the whole time. Perfect. So, and I will say, uh, I'm Sarah. I, I am the those people that you keep referring to. Perfect. The these people. Um, I started my career in 911 before we had fancy computer. We had a phone. It rang. That was what it did, right? So I've been in this industry a long time. Um, now I'm a researcher, disaster researcher, professor, 
And I think one of the fundamental issues that we have is the public safety practitioners um, at the field level, they don't care about these things. They put the red stuff, wet stuff on the red stuff. They put the bad guys in jail. The emergency managers live in that space to try and coordinate. But the decision makers don't speak the language of tech at all. And that is a fundamental issue we have. They don't know where the, I, I can't even tell you how many people have come to me and said, what's the best software for this? I'm like, well, what do you need it to do? Things and stuff. They can't even, they don't speak the language to the point that they don't, they can't even scope a problem because it's a fundamental lack in their background, their education, their training. Part of it is government. Government, um, you have to really want to be a government tech person because there's not a lot of money in it generally, especially at the local level. But this idea of, I don't even know what's capable, so I can't tell you what I want it to do. I just know I have a problem. And that, I think, is the sweet spot in, in conversation is, is I can, I can tell you what's wrong, but I don't even know the possibility of fixing it. So I can't go to a vendor and say, I need this, because when you ask a vendor, every vendor has the best solution for your problem because you don't know what your problem actually is. And, and one of the best cases I've seen of that, best, worst, however you want to look at it, is a police department I worked for many years ago that implemented a new fancy computer-aided dispatch and computer-aided reporting system, all this stuff. What they didn't do is spec their internal systems and realize that none of the cops knew how to type. So they went from recording all their reports and sending them to a transcriptionist, to now they had to type. And people were getting written up because they're, they're months down the road, they're behind. They had to send a bunch of cops to typing school because they didn't fully scope the project because they didn't understand how. So I think that's the, that's the fundamental piece in here is they don't speak the language, so they don't have, and their education doesn't include any of the technology bits. It's not there. So. Perfect. Yeah, so that's a good one, and I think it's actually one that I've completely missed in this presentation. So thank you so much for putting it out, is that they don't know what they don't know. Correct. Right? They don't know. So they're not even here because now they're going, huh? for something that's actually really important. So, good Okay, okay, let's get, let's, okay, we, we, I'm told to hurry it up. Okay, yes. Hi, I'm a CISO in light rail. One of the biggest challenges are the life cycles in which these systems exist, and we cannot make changes in a cheap way, and we're now at seven and eight figure numbers for systems that are supposed to be in there for 15 years. And so I think the biggest challenge is, is, you know, as cybersecurity continues to evolve in terms of threats and other things on the landscape, how do you put something in today that was that can protect something that didn't even think about our back, you know, 10, 15 years ago? Yeah, no, exactly. That, that's a, and part of the problem there is there may not be a solution at that level, right? Your risk management might well have to be accept that there is a risk and now you've got to put governance, policy, procedure around it somehow, right? At this point, there's no easy, there may not be an easy answer because there's no resources and time is one of the resources that they may not have. Yes, how, how are we doing for time? A couple more questions. Okay. Um, in the slide before we just said about how uh, people can help, maybe not for fire departments, but police departments um, will typically do a two-year audit, CGIS, so they may already have a list of things they need to improve upon and so if people want to sort of knock on the door that could be an avenue to say hey I'm here to help and can I take something off your plate there um, just as an idea for everybody in the room yep yeah so no, knowing their cycles which I'm yeah and there's, there's tons of audits that I think public safety and just if you're looking for grants you have to do anyway so there's probably a a list of activities that they know they need to improve upon yep good one anyone else Okay. Well, look, that, if, did you have a, okay. Well, look, that, that, thank you so very much. Um, please do stay in touch, um, especially if anyone has any comments about, oh, so I've been on the academia government side. I'd love to know more, uh, get more, more, you know, in depth on the vendor side and the, on the, on the uh, private industry side of the house. So please do reach out to me, um, email address. I'm, you can find me on LinkedIn and all that, but otherwise, 
Please enjoy the rest of the event. And thanks once again to the organizers for inviting me and for you know, listening to me for the last 45 minutes.